Welcome to New York Law School. How's everyone doing today? Great. Great. Or as we like to say, we are New York's law school. I'm Anthony Crowell, the dean and president here, and we are honored you are here with us for an historic and auspicious moment as we host United States Supreme Court Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We are honored to host so many distinguished guests, including from our state and federal judiciaries, our board of trustees, and our wonderful faculty. And I also want to just offer a very special thank you to our extraordinary team here at the law school who's worked tirelessly with Sybil Shamewell to put this extraordinary event together. So thank you. The Shamewald Lecture is always a magnificent event and each one of them has featured a momentous national leader, including Supreme Court Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Stephen Breyer, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, former Senators and Cabinet Secretaries John Kerry and Chuck Hagel, the late Senator Ted Kennedy, and most recently, former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell. The series provides a unique forum for thoughtful and intellectual discussion featuring the most prominent leaders in public and judicial service. It was founded by our very own Sybil Shanewald. Sybil? <laughs> she is an alumna and a member of our Board of Trustees, and the lecture series was established in honor of her late husband, Sidney, who led an incredibly dynamic life as a highly successful accountant, but also a highly successful consumer advocate. Sib <laughs> Sybil herself is a 1976 graduate of New York Law School. She attended law school as an evening student after a successful career in consumer advocacy. Armed with her degree, she became one of the foremost legal pioneers in the world, a visionary who has made fighting for women's health her unrelenting mission for the last three decades. Her impact and legacy can be seen everywhere from New York to Bangladesh. Just last November, we honored Sybil, as well as our wonderful Professor Nadine Strassen here, as two of our groundbreaking women, a term that is one of the words we can describe our special guest, Justice Ginsburg, today. Justice Ginsburg is, of course, a giant in our profession, and she has transcended into a singular cultural icon. <laughs> now, well, I say that because um, a student recently asked me why we refer to her as that, and I pointed to something that my predecessor here at the law school left me. It was a coaster with Justice Ginsburg's image on it. And then Sybil, as any good dean would do when a board of trustees, a member of the board of trustees, uh, uh, provides wardrobe, she gave me socks with Justice Ginsburg's image on them <laughs> in a very public way, and I'm required to wear them, but proudly and happily wear them today nonetheless. <laughs> so beyond that, I'm going to leave um, comments about her extraordinary body of work as an attorney and jurist to Chief Judge Robert Katzman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and Ken Feinberg both of whom uh, hold honorary degrees from New York Law School, uh, Ken from 2012 and Judge Katzman from 2016. I will say, though, as a law dean who works every day with aspiring lawyers, I've never seen someone have quite the effect that Justice Ginsburg has had on our students. If you walk through this building today, you will see our auditorium filled to the max, classrooms filled to the max, the level of participation among our student body is truly extraordinary. I couldn't be more proud. I do think there's a wide range of reasons why, but the essence is that she is compelling. She came into the profession at a time where there were few women and overcame every obstacle in her path to reach the heights she has. At MYLS, we're proud that our student body today is 60% women. It's a truly incredible feat. She, her career and her life convey a message that we like to convey to all of our students. She's embodied a fearlessness, a relentlessness, and unmatched grit at every step. Grit is 
a trait shared by many of our students, and all of us here work hard to ensure our students have it to help fuel them as they move into their careers. Having grit helps overcome so much, and many of our students have persevered through huge challenges to make it through our doors, and Justice Ginsburg's example has been a unique source of inspiration to them. When she arrived today, we greeted her with several of our student leaders, many are in the room with us, and I can't just, I can't express the joy and excitement that was on their face. It was something I won't forget. Her accomplishments and legacy don't just rest on historic judicial impact, but they live in the thousands of young people like these students who look up to her as their role model of what a leader in our profession and society should be. And I'm especially excited for her talk today as we get two historic figures for the price of one with New York Law School's John Marshall Harlan II professor, Nadine Strassen, leading the conversation. I now turn it over to the person who made today possible, Sybil Shainwald, to say a few words of welcome. Welcome, everyone. I am so pleased that, I've, that you're all here, and I am so pleased with our guest of honor, who couldn't be better than Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Couldn't have done more for society, civilization, and the, the judicial system. Thank you, Dean Crow, for your extremely kind introduction, and welcome to the 10th lecture in honor of my remarkable partner, Sydney Shanewald, who was extremely supportive of my going to New York Law School four nights a week for four years. Uh, he believed in the Equal Rights Amendment, gave money to Emily's List before I did, <laughs> and nobody would have enjoyed listening more to Justice Ginsburg and Judge Katzman, Ken Feinberg, all of whom represent Sydney's ideals of social and economic justice, and all of whom are working to attain those goals. This audience is filled with people who represent Sydney's values in so many different areas, people who care about the world and who work to make it a better place. He would have enjoyed talking politics, especially at this time. <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'm, I will not take up time with this um, program, although I could say a lot about my wonderful husband, and he would be most proud to be here today. Sidney paid tribute to the founding president of Consumers Union and spoke on behalf of his staff for Consum Consumers Union on <clears throat> the occasion of uh, Dr. Cole's Colston Warren's retirement. Jim Guest is here from Consumers Union, somewhere. And uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, you, this is what um, Sydney said about Colston Warren: a unique model, a once-in-a-lifetime production, exceedingly efficient, definitely top-rated and the best buy ever. The same can be said for Sydney Shainwald. It is an honor to introduce Kenneth Feinberg. Kenneth Feinberg is in <laughs> Come back, come back. <laughs> he needs no introduction, it's true. But he's the na nation's leading expert in mediation and alternative dispute resolution. He has administered numerous high profile compensation programs, having served as special master, as you all know, of the September 11th Vic uh, uh, Victims Compensation Fund. In this capacity, Mr. Feinberg developed and promulgated the regulations governing the fund's administration, 
oversaw the evaluation of applications, determination of appropriate compensation, and dissemination of awards totaling over $7 billion. Come back. <laughs> Ken is now serving as special master of the U.S. Victims State Sponsored Terrorism Fund being administered by the Department of Justice. Among the numerous funds and compensation plans, Ken has served in a pro bono capacity, an administrator in the past, the Sandy Hook Victims Compensation, the Aurora Victim Relief Fund following the Colorado movie theater shooting in 2012, the One Fund Boston Victim Relief Fund arising out of the Boston Marathon bombings where three people were killed and several pe hundred people were injured, the One Orlando Fund for the victims of the Pulse nightclub shooting. In 2010, the Obama administration appointed Ken to serve as administrator of the Gulf Coast Claims Facility to compensate victims of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Secretary of the Treasury Timothy Geithner appointed Ken in 2009 to serve as special master of the TARP, Trouble Asset Relief Program. Uh, in order to de determine the compensation structure of employees of corporate top recipients who had received exceptional financial assistance. Ken was also appointed settlement master victims of DES by Judge Dak B. Barnstein, who is here today. And uh, <clears throat> Ken was designated Lawyer of the Year by the National Law Journal. I think he's lawyer of the century, but. <laughs> um, he is listed in Profiles and Power, the 100 Most Influential Lawyers in America. He is the author's, author of numerous articles and essays on mediation, mass torts, and other matters. He received his JD from New York University, where he was articles editor of the Law Review. He was a law clerk for Judge Stanley Fold, New York State Court of Appeals from, I guess, 1970 to 72. Uh, at any anyway, at any rate, I'm sorry. Uh, he was he became a partner at Kayshore, Fearman, Hayes, and Handler from 1980 to 1993, and founded the law office, the law offices of Kenneth R. Feinberg shortly thereafter. Ken Feinberg is the nation's most renowned mediator, an extraordinary man, a fabulous friend. It is my honor and my privilege to introduce him. I want to thank uh, Sybil for that 22-minute introduction. <laughs> I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say after that. No, um, this is just the latest example, as you know, of what Sybil does. If there's any lawyer in the United States who understands the call to service and the requirement that lawyers give back to the country, it's Sybil Chainwald. And great. <laughs> I also, at the risk of, you know, I could mention a hundred people in this room, but I must mention my colleague Camille Byros, who's sitting right here, who right now is trying to resolve hundreds of church abuse cases in the state of New York. And uh, the fact that my colleague is here today means that the Feinberg Law Firm basically is closed today. <laughs> I mean, it's a holiday, I guess, but. I also want to pick up on just one point Sybil said. You cannot uh, imagine uh, the importance and the impact of American law over the last 50 years or more that Jack Weinstein of the Eastern District has had in this country. I simply have to introduce two people. First, the Chief Judge of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, Judge Katzman, appointed 
Appointed as a judge in the Second Circuit 1999, Chief Judge 2013, I can tell you, uh, because he won't, uh, the steps he's taken as Chief Judge, creative, bold outreach to the consumers of justice in this country, the American people and others, and the fact that he's here today uh, to participate um, signals, uh, I think, is, is an important milestone, and we thank the Chief Judge for his incredible service to the nation. And finally, I want to introduce um, our um, uh, interviewer, Professor Strassen, here at the law school, New York Law School, one, one, of, one of the law school's own, and also is a very, very important former head of the American Civil Liberties Union, who I can tell you, during her tenure, really brought the American Civil Liberties Union uh, into the forefront of uh, modern American law in this country. Uh, she played a tremendous role in that, and we're grateful that Professor Strassen has agreed to interview Justice Ginsburg today. <laughs> now, before I turn it over to Professor Strassen, who's going to question, uh, ask questions of Justice Ginsburg and then take questions. There is one question that when it's time for the audience to ask questions, we don't have a lot of time, do not ask the following question of Justice Ginsburg because I'll preempt it so everybody will know and then we can go on to other questions about federal preemption and federal law and all that. Do not ask her how long she plans to serve on the bench. <laughs> She has told me, so we'll preempt it, that she plans to serve at least another 20 years. So there we are. And with that, I am done. And my job now is introduce the distinguished Chief Judge, Judge Bob Katzman. Ken Feinberg, thank you so much for your very kind words and for your many tireless contributions to the public good. And I also uh, want to uh, thank uh, Dean Crowell, uh, Sybil Shanewald. It is an honor to uh, be part of this lecture and to offer a few words about Justice Ginsburg. I have the great uh, privilege and pleasure of calling Justice Ginsburg a close friend and indeed, I have thought of her and her beloved husband, Marty, as family members. We met in the 1980s when I was in Washington, D.C., working at the Brookings Institution and then at Georgetown, where Mar Marty taught as well. I was witness to her, uh, her confirmation uh, journey nearly 25 years ago when Senator Moynihan, her Senate sponsor, asked that I be of assistance as her nomination weaved its way through the Senate. To say that I was not needed is an understatement. <laughs> How do you introduce someone who, who, who needs no introduction? How do you introduce someone who's so famous she's known just by her initials? <laughs> who has, per, perhaps uh, most surprisingly to her, attained world celebrity? She is the subject of a new documentary a feature film starring Felicity uh, Jones and Army Hammer. She is the subject of an opera. Her face, as uh, Dean Crowell has said, appears on t-shirts, mugs, tote bags. You can learn how she works out in a new exercise book <laughs> written by her trainer. You may have seen the uh, Politico story by the reporter who said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's workout routine nearly killed me. that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been a path-marking legal mind as a lit litigating architect of gender equality, we know. That she has been and is a jurist of extraordinary distinction who has left such an indelible mark on the law, we know. That the world is a better place because of her, we honor and cheer, and that we all know. What more then can be said about this brilliant, compassionate judge, appreciator of music, art, the world, who is really a living legend, and I think we would all say de deservedly so. I offer some personal 
some glimpses into the, the life of this Renaissance human. First, uh, this observation. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's concern about the world around her began early. As a 13-year-old, in a bulletin published by the East Midwood Jewish Center, a year after the end of World War II, she wrote, and this, this can be found in, in, uh, in her book, My Own Words, and I quote, this is a 13-year-old, we must never forget the horrors which our brethren were subjected to in Bergen-Belsen and other Nazi concentration camps. Then too, we must try hard to understand that for righteous people, hate and prejudice are neither good occupations nor fit companions. This is a 13-year-old. We cannot feel safer until every nation, regardless of weapons or power, will meet together in good faith the people worthy of mutual association. There can be a happy world, and there will be once again, when men create a strong bond towards one another, a bond unbreakable by a studied prejudice or a passing circumstance. As she grieved the loss of life in Bergen-Belsen, 13-year-old Ruth Bader could not have known that one casualty of that concentration camp just a year earlier was a young girl, also a writer, just four years older than the young Ruth. Anne Frank, too, wrote about the human condition and yearned for a happier world. Some years ago, I sent Justice Ginsburg a new edition of the diary of Anne Frank because I had read a passage in the diary in which Anne Frank pondered why women were thought inferior to men. I have imagined that had, Fran had Anne Frank survived, that somehow she and Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have met in the course of their lives and become friends and then work together on the world stage these minds that grappled with humanity and justice, minds that loved art too. Another observation. Justice Ginsburg's influence as a writer, always a reader and a writer, sensitive to words and rhythm and style. She says herself that her writing bears the traces of one of her college professors, Vladimir Nabokov. Yes, that Vladimir Nabokov. Her words and phrasing have a clarity and an elegance and a rhythm. The next time you read a Ginsburg opinion, I urge you to read her sentences aloud, and you will understand what I mean. Her writings are truly guides for the rest of us in the trenches. Her book recommendations. Justice Ginsburg's life's canvas is wide-ranging. Take, for example, the book she reads. With wide-ranging interests, she might recommend any number of books. For example, Donna Leone's novels. The mysteries take place in Venice with detailed descriptions, not just of the city, but of the food. Marty, will, Marty, as she will tell you, first told her about those mysteries. One of her proudest moments, when she performed as she did not long ago at the Washington Opera, or perhaps when Placido Domingo serenaded her at a Harvard degree ceremony. <laughs> a friend for all seasons. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a person with a happy, thriving family and a close network of friends, colleagues, and former clerks. When a friend is in the hospital during the holiday season confronting serious health issues, this Supreme Court justice checks in daily with indispensable support and guidance, giving hope inspiration, and, and cheer. How she does all that she does, she, she really must have super human powers to be able to do so much in the course of a day. Determination and perseverance. When she missed her high school graduation because her mother, a role model and hardworking bookkeeper, had just passed away, the young Ruth carried with her that searing loss and also had the resolve to continue on with discipline, looking forward, tackling challenging work at college, at Cornell, where, there were, where few, men, few women were. It was a perseverance that would mark her approach to life, 
still so young and grounded in conscientiousness and honesty. She had good fortune and judgment. And with that judgment and good fortune, she met and then married the very brilliant, very confident Martin Ginsburg, who I think, by the way, would say that she also had the good judgment to, to marry him. <laughs> the incomparable Marty. Taking a break from a conference in Madrid not long ago, visiting Gaudi's unfinished cathedral, Sagrada Familia, which he had not seen in some 20 years, when observing the display that depicted the innovative structural engineering behind the cathedral, just as Ginsburg remembered, Marty was fascinated by that. As a judge, as we all know, Justice Ginsburg has left her mark and continues to do so with her extraordinary opinions and dissents that bear her signature. And in so doing, she has expressed the fairness that is America's promise. She is a jurist who never takes a cheap shot, who understands that the opposing sides have their views as well. Even as she might dismantle the arguments of the opposing side or sides, she does so respectfully and civilly. How to understand a capacious, organized brain that knows the Constitution, that knows the law, that's methodical and also attentive to nuance and style, that has such a keen understanding of the noble aspirations of this country, keeping in mind the rights of the individuals, especially the most vulnerable in society. Perhaps Sometimes there's no fully accounting for greatness. It's here, and we do well when we recognize it and know it and honor it. I speak for everyone here when I say, welcome, Justice Ginsburg. We are so happy that you're here, and we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for those wonderful introductory remarks. And now to the main course after delightful appetizers. Um, Justice Ginsburg, it is so generous of you to spend your precious time and share your wisdom with us. And I really appreciate the fact that you are so open. You have instructed everybody who's interviewed you to uh, ask you anything with no preclearance subject to the Ginsburg rule, which means we may not ask about any issue that is before the Supreme Court or will is likely to come before the Supreme Court. So I will try to honor that, but I do remember Alexis de Tocqueville warning that in America, just about every issue may end up before the Supreme <laughs> Court. So. Um, you will, you will exercise your right to uh, cut me off if I, if I tread on, on inappropriate ground. So I also wanted to tell you, Justice Ginsburg, that I solicited questions from students and other members of the New York Law School community. So I'm going to be asking you a mix of questions from myself and questions from other people. I, I wanted to start, though, with the ACLU, because that is what first brought me in contact with you when I was a student, and I, I love the fact that I can empathize with the students in the overflow audience and, and here, uh, because I heard you when I was a beginning student at Harvard Law School, and you were absolutely inspiring to me and really made me think seriously of the ACLU as a wonderful place to do work, not only for women's rights, but for uh, human rights more broadly. I'd love it if you could comment on why you chose the ACLU and how it fit with your concept of women's rights and gender equality. Let's go back to the late 60s, early 70s. It was apparent to me that the Supreme Court would soon catch up with the change in the way people were living their lives. And I thought about what group I might affiliate with. And I thought about the National Organization for Women, mm -hmm. the Women's Equity Action League. And then it came to me that if women's rights are to be high on the human rights agenda, men had to be part of the 
operation too. And the ACLU being uh, the foremost protective of civil liberties organization in the United States seemed the right place to be. I will say that early on there were some misgivings among many ACLU supporters. They thought that the ACLU had a client. That client was the First Amendment mm -hmm. and that a shoemaker should stick to his last. But uh, although the ACLU came to the women's rights advocacy um, somewhat reluctantly, once they got there, they were at it full steam. And I think, Nadine, you're too young to remember some people who were instrumental in bringing the ACLU yeah. there. One was Dorothy Kenyon. Yes. I never met her, but she's a legend. And her mission was to put women on juries in every state in the United States. You know, students today, when they, they hear that it wasn't so long ago that this very state, New York, had an, an exemption from jury service for any woman. That was Dor Dorothy Kenyon. The other was Paulie Mary. She's amazing. Who was on the ACLU's e Equality mm -hmm. Committee and had written an article in the 1960s that impressed me uh, strongly. It was called Jane Crow yeah. and the Law, and she traced the many ways in which the law differentiated on the basis of gender and explained how those laws were not as was once thought favors to women. Well, that's a long answer to why. Well, no, but the, the, yeah, that's a very, because. very fascinating, and there are a lot of threads to pick up on. But one that I would like to follow is you're so famous for having always advocated gender equality for men as well as women and representing men. I believe for reasons of principle, but also for reasons of strategy. Could you comment on that? And then why the name Women's Rights Project? Or maybe you were not part of the naming process. The, the overall goal of the project was to advance the welfare of girls Girl. and women uh -huh. so that the half of society that had been a subordinate would be able to contribute and, and do whatever their talent allowed them to do. Absolutely. And I want to ask also in terms of, uh, you, you made this comment about the ACLU thinking that uh, the First Amendment was the only client. You were not only uh, the founding director of the Women's Rights Project, but what is somewhat less well known, you were a member of the ACLU's National Board of Directors and a general counsel at a time when the ACLU had its own glass ceilings, right? There were relatively <coughs> few women in those positions of organizational leadership. Uh, I remember when you were nominated for the Supreme Court, Marty called me and I, we had to help him produce every single minute of every yeah. single board meeting that you had ever attended and every issue you had ever debated. Let, let me tell you yeah. something about that. Um, my White House handlers were a little, little concerned about my ACU connection. And they knew that the committee had asked for all those materials. And so they would quiz me. You were on the ACL, uh, ACLU board in 1976. That year they passed this or that resolution. Mm -hmm. How did you vote? <laughs> and my response was, forget it. There was <laughs> nothing you can do that would lead me to speak of the ACLU in any but the most praiseworthy terms. Well, as it turned out, 
1993, July 1993, not a single question was asked at the hearings about my ACLU. Yeah. I, I was going to I was going to ask you about that. Um, it was very surprising. Uh, obviously, you had been prepared for that, and um, just a few years earlier, Michael Dukakis, uh, for the young people in the audience, the Democratic nominee for president, was attacked by George Bush Sr. as being a card-carrying member of the ACLU. Uh, so it was not the most popular organization in many quarters. And I looked up, I remembered that Calvin Trillin had written this amazing ditty in the nation on the nomination of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm only going to read a few lines. Uh, somehow, all the White House vetters remained unmoved by those four letters that spooked Dukakis through and through the dread quartet ACLU. <laughs> The paths in women's p law she plowed were plowed while working for this crowd. Republicans don't seem annoyed to hear the judge was thus employed. They cheer she made some law impartial and got compared to Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think had changed? I mean, why was that the case? It's a compound question. And would that happen today? Would, some, would somebody with your background, with an advocacy organization such as the ACLU, be confirmed 96 to 3, be confirmed at all, be nominated at all? And Nadine, may, I will answer that question, yeah. but may I go back to oh, the, yes, to the comment may. you made before about that a number of the, in a number of the cases that the ACLU brought in the 70s, mm -hmm. the plaintiffs were men. Yeah, sure. The person disadvantaged was always the woman. So they were all about how society uh, treated women. So to take um, one of my favorite cases, Stephen Weisenfeld's mm -hmm. case, mm -hmm. this was a man who was married to a high school math teacher. She had a healthy pregnancy. She taught into mm -hmm. the ninth month. They went to the hospital, and the obstetrician came out and said, you have a healthy baby boy, but your wife died of an embolism. Mm -hmm. and Stephen Weisenfeld vowed that he would not work full time until his child was in school mm -hmm. full time. And he figured out that between Social Security benefits plus what he could earn, up to the ceiling, he could just, just about make it. Mm -hmm. So he went to the Social Security office and applied for what were called child in care benefits. Mm -hmm. He was told, we're very sorry, but these are mother's benefits. They're not available mm -hmm. to fathers. He then wrote a letter to the editor, to his local Edison, New Jersey um, newspaper. And it went like this. I've been hearing so much about women's lib. <laughs> Let me tell you my story. Mm -hmm. And then the tagline was, does Gloria Steinem know about this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was suggested to him that he called the New Jersey affiliate of the ACLU, and that's when his case began. When it got to the Supreme Court, and how did how did you get involved with it, Justice Ginsburg? Uh, a friend who was on the Rutgers faculty in the Spanish department mm -hmm. lived in New Jersey, read the letter, mm -hmm. called me, mm -hmm. and I suggested to her that she had. Stephen Call, the New mm -hmm. Jersey affiliate. So in those days, you could go to a three-judge federal district mm -hmm. court and then right to the Supreme Court <coughs> with no mm -hmm. intermediate appellate court in between. So I was up to the Supreme Court's decision. Unanimous judgment, reasoning, divided three ways. Yeah. 
Justice Brennan led the group that said, of course, the discrimination begins with the woman. She pays the same social security taxes as the man, but her taxes don't get for her family the same benefits as a male wage earner mm -hmm. family would get. And then there were a few who thought, this is discrimination against men as parents. If women are widowed, they have the choice to take personal care of mm -hmm. their infant. But men don't have that choice. They mm -hmm. must work mm -hmm. and provide a substitute for themselves at home. And then one, who later became my chief, yeah. he was then Justice <laughs> Brent, was said, this is totally arbitrary from the point of view of the, the child. baby. Yeah. <laughs> Why should the child have the opportunity for care from a sole surviving parent mm -hmm. if that parent is female but not if the surviving parent is male? So that case illustrates how gender-based lines in the law hurt everyone. They hurt women, they hurt men and children. And you make, make that point brilliantly, and I was just being devil's advocate and suggesting, well, maybe it should even be called the, the Human Rights Project. Uh, but let's go back to... Yeah, the ACLU uh, and, and the uh, non-issue. Let me start with the 80s, when my yeah. good friend, Justice Scalia, was nominated. Yeah. He was, it was well known uh, what his views were. He had been a law professor, done a lot of speaking and writing, and he had been my buddy on the D.C. circuit. The, the vote was unanimous yeah. to confirm him. 1993, despite my ACLU connection, <laughs> the vote to confirm me was 96 to 3. May I tell people who those, those three naysayers were? Uh, <laughs> the only vote, and this is from Linda Greenhouse's New York Times article at the time, the only votes against her came from three conservative Republicans, Jesse Helms of North Carolina, Don Nichols of Oklahoma, and Robert C. Smith of New Hampshire. There was one Democratic senator who was absent from the vote. Senator Helms contended that she supports the right to abortion unreservedly and, this is 1993, is likely to uphold the homosexual agenda. <laughs> <laughs> and let me say, Jesse Helm uh, was extremely helpful in this respect. My colleague on the DC Circuit, David Santel, mm -hmm. had been Jesse Helm's advance man for for a number of years. And David came into my chambers at the DC Circuit. He gave me a big bear hug and he said, Ruth, Jesse's not going to vote for you. I said, heaven for fenders. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, but he won't hold you up because any senator could have put yes, a hold on me and that yeah. would have carried the nomination over until yeah. the fall. But I had the luxury of coming on board. I was confirmed August 3rd so I could prepare for leak for that first Monday in October. Great. Well, things... Well, but, but just think, it was the same for Justice Breyer. He had, his right. vote was in the 90s. For the last uh, four nominees, mm -hmm. it hasn't been that way. Yeah. The vote divided on party lines, mm -hmm. and this is a plague on both your houses because mm -hmm. that was to uh, not just Elena Kagan and, and Sonja Sotomayor, but also uh, my current chief, mm -hmm. Chief Justice Roberts, and Justice Alito. Mm -hmm. and my hope is that we will one day get back to the way it was and the way it should be. Do you, do you have any advice for how that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> 
I think Chief Judge Katzman arranged what I think was a very good beginning. There's an opera called Scalia the Yes, Insert. yes. And he decided it would be a good idea if the members of the House and Senate Judiciary Committee and their staff were invited to hear excerpts from Scalia Ginsburg. Um, I think it may have been effective, at least. Uh, Senator Grassley asked to have a copy of my <laughs> remarks the next day. I think it will happen, uh, and I expect to live to see it. And, and it ties into, I mean, your friendship with Justice Scalia, whom you famously called your, your best buddy on the court. Uh, but you've also, so that obviously bridged it, some ideological differences, but you've also talked about the Supreme Court as the most collegial place you've ever worked, and that remains true despite the partisan breakdowns in the appointment process. You've actually said it was an even more, is an even more collegial place to work than the ACLU, <laughs> than Columbia <laughs> Law School, like Rutgers Law School. Uh, so seriously, can you give some um, tips from that experience, how the Supreme Court as an institution is able to work so collegially and even have personal friendships across divides that seem unbridgeable, not only in Congress, but on so many college campuses and in our community at large. We know that the institution can't work and well for the people of the United States if we don't respect, and in most cases, genuinely like each other. We begin every conference and every sitting day by going around the room, each justice shakes hands with every other. And that's to say, you circulated a nasty dissent yesterday, but mm -hmm. we're all in this together. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to use Justice, one of Justice Scalia's favorite expressions, get over it. <laughs> Um, the Supreme Court is small in, in, a, in a town that's puffed up with bureaucracy. Mm. Our operation is only the nine justices, four law clerks, two judicial assistants, one chamber's aide, and that's it. I can tell you uh, why I, I, I regard the, my colleagues in some way as family. During my uh, tenure, I have had two bouts with cancer. And both times, my colleagues rallied around me and made it possible to get through those trying times without missing a day in court. Uh, Justice O'Connor's advice. Ruth, you're going to have chemotherapy. I set it up for Friday. <laughs> that way you'll get over it by Monday. <laughs> and don't even think about answering all the letters and the calls from well wishes that yeah. you will yeah. receive. Justice Souter said, anything that I can do, Ruth, anything at all, just call me. So I called him one day and said, I'm at Washington Hospital Center and I just finished with my chemotherapy. And Marty, my husband, called and said, when you're, when you're through at the cancer center, come see me in the heart, heart wing. He was yeah, having yeah. a heart procedure. We had tickets the next, next night to the Washington National Opera. So I called Justice Souter and said, you told me that it was anything, anything at all that I would like. Just call you. I'm calling to ask if you will come with me to the opera tomorrow night because <laughs> I don't want to sit next to an empty seat. Aww. And Justice Souter, who, who is the only person I know who works even harder than I do, <laughs> I came to the Washington Opera. Uh, people were astonished because he had received so many invitations and he'd always said, 
sorry. <laughs> uh, I think the only time he'd been there was when they had a preview of the, a film about Thurgood Marshall. Oh. Yeah. So, so there, oh, and then the, the chief, I can't tell you what, uh, which opinions these were, what he said. Ruth, I, I'm going to keep your assignment light. And I said, not yet. This is when I'd done the surgery and hadn't yet started the chemotherapy and radiation. <laughs> I said, chief, not now. Now I feel good. But then when I'm going through radiation, so he said, all right, which case would you like? <laughs> it, it never happened before and it never happened again <laughs> so when I told him he said oh I was going to take that one for myself <laughs> but he gave it to me I mean, what you're describing obviously is getting to know people as individuals and not putting them in ideological boxes and unfortunately from what we read statistically and anecdotally there are a lot of people who won't even don't even want to meet somebody of a different political party and so forth um, I, you have often commented in the same vein both on a personal and an institutional basis about how anger is such an unconstructive emotion and I think about you all the time in fact I've heard that uh, those lines from you quoted a lot because we're living in an era of outrage and and it's often righteous outrage that is justified by explosion against injustices that have been committed such as sexual harassment or racial discrimination in the criminal justice system uh, but could you comment about um, a constructive way to be passionately engaged in combating injustice, but how anger might not necessarily effectively advance that cause. I'll give you the example of a young woman named Shana Kniznik. She was a second year student at NYU Law School when the court handed down its decision in the Shelby County case which declared that the most important provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 unconstitutional, despite that act having been re renewed periodically with overwhelming majorities on both sides. And so Shana was angry, but then she thought, that's not constructive. What can I do that would be positive? And what she did was to start a Tumblr with my dissenting opinion mm -hmm. in the Shelby County case. Mm -hmm. And then it took off from there and it just wild blew beyond it. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. I am soon to be 85, and everyone wants to take their picture with me. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the beginning of the notorious RBG yes. movement. Yes. And uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. You've often said that you, uh, if you had your fantasy job, you would be an opera diva. Instead, <laughs> you've had to settle for having an opera written about you and being a social media rock star. So, not to mention the star of a, of a film. And I, for those of you who read the coverage about Sundance where Justice Ginsburg talked with Nina Totenberg, uh, all the buzz was that you were the biggest celebrity there. <laughs> And I also heard you said that Robert Redford really is good looking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I, and I have to tell you something of all the different accolades that have been paid to you, I will tell you that one of my former RAs and her best friend are having your initials tattooed on their. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one thing that I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't tell me which body part. I did not inquire. Um, but I, I think it's so interesting. I saw a theme of I love to celebrate law students and the potential power that they have. So the fact that the second year law student started the whole notorious RBG movement. Um, you've already mentioned the opera. That was actually written by the Scalia Ginsburg opera. was written by another law student, right? Yes, it was a young man. A musician, 
He had degrees in music from Harvard and Yale, and then decided that it might be good to know a little about the law. So he enrolled in his local law school, which was the University of Maryland. He takes a constitutional law course, and he comes upon these dueling opinions. Scalia for the court, Ginsburg in dissent. Ginsburg for the court, Scalia in dissent. And decides that this could make a very funny opera. <laughs> the opera is roughly based on the plot of the magic flute. Scalia is locked in a dark room being punished for excessive dissenting. <laughs> I then enter through a glass ceiling to help him to help him get through the test that he must pass in order to be released from the dark room. Then a character who's left over from Don Giovanni in this in, in, in Scalia Ginsburg, he's called the commentatory. <laughs> um, he said, why would you want to help him? He's your enemy. And I say, he's not my enemy. He's my good friend. And then we sing a duet. We are different. <laughs> different in our interpretation of legal texts but one, one in our reverence for the Constitution and for the institution we serve. Before that closing duet, the two of us are introduced to the audience, Scalia by singing a very Handelian rage aria, <laughs> which goes like this. The justices are blind. How could they possibly see? About this, the Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. <laughs> and then I answer him, you are searching for bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that, like our society, it can evolve. Yeah. And then the lyric soprano breaks into a jazz routine, <laughs> let it grow, let it grow. <laughs> That's wonderful. The other, um, I, I thought I knew a lot about you. I had read everything you've written and uh, dissents and majority alike and uh, read a lot about you. But in preparing for this interview, I learned some things that, that, that I hadn't uh, known before. And one was... Or, and maybe it's not accurate, I, I, I hasten to say, but I read that you first started teaching women and the law or women's equality when you were at Rutgers Law School because at the behest of female students who asked you to teach that course. Is that right? And can you tell us a little bit yes, about it? What yes. had you been doing before that? I'd been teaching procedure and federal courts and conflict of laws. <laughs> There, there were two things that propelled me into the women's rights arena. One was the students, as you mentioned. They asked to have a course on women and the law. Were those courses being taught at other law schools yet at that point? Uh, NYU had a, a student-initiated course. In fact, I think the students at Rutgers were stimulated by the mm -hmm. NYU students. Mm -hmm. And a, a few other. Mm -hmm. places. Well, to teach this course, I repaired to the library, and in very short order, I'd read every federal decision that had to do with women's rights or the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And that was no mean feat. Mm -hmm. There was precious little. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was no more than what would be produced in six months th these days. Did the students approach you because you were one of the few female faculty yes. members? Or? Yes. Uh, there was one other woman on the faculty. She preceded me by a year. Um, then there was an, another thing, and it was 
the New Jersey affiliate of the ACLU, they began to get complaints of the kind they didn't have before. So who should help them with these cases? Well, why not the procedure teacher at Rutgers? Oh. Many of the complaints were from school teachers who were forced onto what was euphemistically called maternity leave as soon as that pregnancy began to show. Because after all, the children didn't think the teacher swallowed a watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> and these women, th their view was, we are ready, willing, and able to do this job. There's no reason why we should have to go on unpaid so-called leave in the fourth month or the fifth month. And then there were some women, factory workers, who, whose employers had good health insurance programs. The women wanted health insurance to cover themselves and their families. The employer told them, you can have coverage for yourself, but family coverage is available only to men. Those new complaints coming in, into the ACLU. So it was a combination of the new complainants on the one hand, my students on the other. And, and one would think that civil procedure doesn't necessarily lead to women's rights, and yet I've also read that it was your work on a project on Swedish civil procedure, civil procedure that led to your um, awareness of gender inequality or the power to do something about it. And if I can add one other thing, um, you have talked about when you were at Harvard Law School where you started your legal studies, I know Columbia is very proud to claim you as a graduate. I think Harvard probably claims you as an alum, too. But um, Anyone who has attended one day is an alum. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> that you actually, there were so few women's restrooms that you even had to leave the building where you were taking an exam to go to another building. There was to, only one. Well, only and, one. And that, that, there's a wonderful book called Pinstripes and Pearls. It's about the class of... 1965 at Harvard Law School, Justice Breyer's class. Mine was earlier, 1959. What was it going to cost Harvard to admit women for the very first time in 1950-51? What it was going to cost was the installation of a woman's bathroom. And there is later Dean Griswold's budget down to the penny, what it would cost to put into Austin Hall, a women's bathroom. But there was just one. And in those days, there were two teaching buildings, Langdell and Austin. And if you were in Langdell, you had to make a mad dash to Austin. And that was particularly trying at exam time. But the, the thing that it's remarkable to me today. The nine women in my class and the five women in Marty's class, we never complained. That, and we I'm, just thought yes. that's the way it is. I, and I'm struck yeah. by that. And I would love to know what changed, what made you think that you should complain and that complaining would get you somewhere. Can you pinpoint that or provide some background? Because of the women's movement that came alive in the late 60s. Oh, we're going, going back to Sweden. Yeah. So, so and I, I should say that one of the prime movers of the Columbia Project on International mm -hmm. Procedure mm -hmm. is the great judge, Jack Weinstein. Uh, we were going through the US code and the federal rules to try to facilitate international cooperation and litigation. And part of the project was to study uh, another system. Mm -hmm. So I was chosen for the Swedish book. There was a book on France, one on Italy and Sweden. I always suspected that the reason they came to me 
is knowledge of French law, knowledge of Italian law might have some commercial payoff. <laughs> but Sweden, they have fewer people than this, the city that we, we are in. So I think they went down the list of women's graduates and then came to me at any rate. And I heard you actually learned Swedish for this project. To, yeah, I had to read the Rettigangsbach, that's their code of procedure. So I'm in Stockholm and I read a column in the daily newspaper. And the topic is, why should the woman have two jobs and the man only one? If Sweden was ahead of the United States at that time, in the early 60s, it was well accepted that families ought to have two earners if they want to do well for their children. But the woman was expected to have dinner on the table at seven, to buy their children's new shoes, take them for their medical checkups. So this column, why should the woman have two jobs and the man only one, uh, was a subject of debate uh, in, among Swedish families. Some women, the queen bee types, thought, I can do it all. I can do everything. I can maintain my medical practice and still make sure that the slippers are waiting for him <laughs> when he comes home. Others said, none of that. He should do a lot more than take out the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> that was the tenor of the, the conversation. And it, I kind of put it on a back burner in 1962 and 63 because I didn't, uh, our society was not yet ready to make that, that move. And then there was something else. I don't know if people are in this audience are old enough to remember the name Sherry Finkbein. Mm -hmm. She was a, a woman who had been prescribed thalidomide by her doctor when she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And she was at a very high risk of having uh, uh, if she uh, carried the fetus to term of having a child that would have multiple disabilities and mm -hmm. not live very long. But she was from Arizona. Abortion wasn't available to her. She had heard that Sweden was a place mm -hmm. with good health care facilities, and she could go there and, and, and have her abortion. And that struck me that a woman from the United States traveled to Sweden to get a procedure that should have been available to her as part of her health care package. I remember that case well, and well, we saw that um, Senator Helms said that you uh, supported abortion. That you know, we saw just a couple of weeks ago the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. It's still as contested as as it was. You famously at the time were constructively critical of the court's analysis. Um, suggesting that maybe a different rationale would have been a stronger one. Is that something that you feel free to comment on? Has your criticism been vindicated by what's happened well, in the many okay, decades? I, this, this is a highly debatable topic. It was my view that it would have been better for the court to proceed the way Thurgood Marshall did. That is, many times he stood before courts and said, Separate but equal is not before the court today. These facilities are vastly unequal. He worked up to Brown v. Board, and the building blocks were in place. A row was the first time the Supreme Court had an abortion uh, case. They had had a contraceptive case, Eisenstadt v. Baird, but... The U.S. versus Vuich, I think, in 1971. Oh. Okay, Kathleen. And that was a due process case. Uh, yeah, yes, that yeah, was yeah, Norman yeah, Dawson's yeah, case. Yeah. 
Um, in any case, my thought was that the the court would work. It, it had an easy case before it. Texas had the most extreme law in the nation. No abortion unless necessary to save the woman's life. The court could have declared that most extreme law unconstitutional. There's something that a very distinguished constitutional law scholar, Paul Freund, said about Roe v. Wade. He said, it's like asking, um, it, um, a grandmother is having a tea for her friends, and she trots out her little grandchild and asks her, do you know how to spell banana? And she says, well, yes, I do, but I don't know where to stop. <laughs> that was that was point coming. But my idea was that, so that would be the beginning, the first step. Then there'd be other cases. Among those other cases would be the Medicaid mm -hmm. coverage mm -hmm. of abortion. And my, it just happened in reverse. The Supreme mm -hmm. Court decided Roe, and then a few days later, in two cases, uh, it said no Medicaid mm -hmm. coverage. Mm -hmm. So you've touched on um, actually litigation strategy, although in fairness, I don't know what relief the plaintiffs in that case were asking for, whether they were overreaching in your view or whether the, the justices did. But it's an opportunity for me to put to you a question that many students were eager to hear you comment on, Justice Ginsburg, since we have a very active and successful moot court team here. They're very proud of their advocacy ability, but always looking to improve it. And obviously, you were a very successful advocate. And as a judge and a justice, I'm sure you've heard advocacy from the worst to the best. Um, can you give some pearls of wisdom for beginning fairly, fairly new advocates of uh, how they can be more effectively, both in their oral and their written uh, advocacy? For oral advocacy, my advice would be remain flexible. You're there to answer the questions that are on the court's mind. If you come with a prepared spiel, you will be distracted. You don't need to lecture the court because they will have read the main lines of your argument in your brief. So use the time. Don't, don't have a painful expression when you're asked a question. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome it and kind of ride with the wave. For uh, brief writing and for opinion writing, my advice would be take the time to write it not only clear but short. The lawyers tend to fill the space allotted. So no matter how many words we say, a, a brief can include. Even in a single issue case, the lawyers will fill it up to the last page. The lawyers who do that are losing an opportunity to keep the court, court's attention. If you want to be sure that not only the law clerk, but the justice will read beyond the summary of argument, hmm. then keep it clear and concise. Okay. I think Bob mentioned read aloud. That's a good test of writing. If the sentence runs on and on, so you have to take a breath in between when, when you're reading it, rewrite it. It's so interesting that you say, take the time to make it short, because one of the questions I got from students uh, was how much editing you do of your own opinions. How many drafts do they go through before you circulate them? Uh, many. And there are many drafts before I circulate to the court, 
And then there are more when I get back, when I call Dear, Dear Ruth letters. Inside the court, we use only first names. And a Dear Ruth letter might say, um, I would like to join your opinion, if you will, take out footnote five, put a citation to my opinion in the XYZ case. <laughs> and in those, um, I follow the advice of Chief Justice Hughes, who said he always tried to write his opinion as clearly and concisely as possible. But if a colleague wanted him to put something in or take it out, well, in it goes or out it goes and let the law schools figure out <laughs> what it meant. <laughs> so an opinion of a collegial court is a, a, an opinion of the court. So at conference, I will take notes on what my colleagues said and try to incorporate their views when we are on the same side. So I never write a majority opinion as though I were queen. I'm not. I'm writing for the court. Mm -hmm. The sense are another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there you have a, a free hand to say what you please what, uh, without worrying about bringing along colleagues. Although sometimes, sometimes when the court divides 5-4, you try mightily to change your four into the five. And it happens, not often, but every now and then it does. I can't disclose the opinion, but there was one time my senior colleague assigned me a dissent in a criminal case. Uh, the vote at the conference was seven to two. In the fullness of time, after the court's opinion and the dissent was circulated. The opinion was released. It was six to three, but the two had become six. Oh. So it ain't over till it's over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we started a little bit late, so I don't want to tax your, your graciousness by um, asking more questions because I want to turn it over to the audience and you should let me know. Do you have time for ten, some audience questions? So I'll call on people in the order in which I, I, I see your hands go up. Do, do we have a microphone for? Oh, I'm so sorry. So please go, to, just stand at the microphone if you don't mind or go to the microphone and if somebody wants to go to that one, we can just alternate questions. I love my wife who's here, my <laughs> Throughout our courtship and our marriage, I heard the following, that she created the first women in the law course mm -hmm. in America at the University of Pennsylvania and NYU Law School, mm. and that one day she received a phone call from a woman who was a law professor at Rutgers Law School <laughs> saying, Diane, I understand you have a syllabus and I'm to create the, uh, the woman in a law course here at Rutgers. Do you think you can send that to me? Does this have any recollection in your <laughs> mind, Justice Diane. Ginsburg? So where is Diane? She's right here. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> so we met, you were at Columbia when we met, I think. Yes, correct. <laughs> so do you remember that phone call? <laughs> yes. I remember Diane. <laughs> Hi. Um, Your Honor, my name is uh, Liz Holtzman, and of course I've taken great pride in your amazing accomplishments. I'd just like to ask you, and I think the students might appreciate the answer as well, what's it been like as more women have joined the court? What difference have women made on the Supreme Court? If you feel comfortable answering that. Well, it makes a tremendous difference for the public coming to see the court. Sandra Day O'Connor was alone. She was the lone woman uh, for 12 years. When I joined her, 
the bar was accustomed to there being a woman on the court. So invariably, at one sitting or the next, a lawyer would refer to me as Justice O'Connor. Justice O'Connor. <laughs> <laughs> and she would sometimes say, I'm Justice O'Connor. She's Justice Ginsburg. <laughs> The worst time was when Justice O'Connor left. I think it was 2006. Mm -hmm. And I was all alone. Mm -hmm. So when the court takes the bench, you see these eight rather well-fed men. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this one a very little woman. And now I am joined by Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan. I sit toward the middle because of my seniority. Justice Sotomayor is my left, Justice Kagan on my right. And anyone who has attended a court session will know that my newest female colleagues are not shrinking by. <laughs> they take a very active part in the colloquy that goes mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. at oral argument. So it's, it's great when the school children who come on a special line 10 minutes mm -hmm. to, to watch the court, um, when they see that. Mm -hmm. So we are, I think we are what they call a critical mass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I'm asked, so when will there be enough? <laughs> My answer is, it's evident when they're online. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a, and I, you don't mean that, do you? <laughs> there was nothing strange about nine men for most of the court's existence. Thank you. More audience questions? I can't believe what a shy audience we have. Can we get questions from the students who are Downstairs or in an overflow room? Okay. This is not a question because I have so many. I would like to present you with something, please. An assortment of vintage French lace collars for you to wear. With oh, you. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, you're, you're giving me permission, as is the absence of audience questions, too. I had this list of topics in categories, and I, was gonna, I thought I could be like a game show host and let you pick the category, but the one I was rooting for was fashion. <laughs> Can I tell you, fashion on the court. Well, a fashion maker, you would think this is unlikely, but it was the old Chief, Chief Justice Rehnquist, oh, who one his, day... Yeah. Came into the conference room with a new robe that had four thin gold stripes on each yes. sleeve. People were appalled. Uh, <laughs> is he trying to act like a master sergeant? <laughs> uh, and I, I couldn't contain my laughter because I knew just what he was doing. That summer in Washington D.C there was a production of the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, Iolanthe. Yeah. There's a part in that for the Lord Chancellor. This was a company with a low budget. <laughs> the Lord Chancellor that sits on the Woolsack in Parliament has four gold stripes, but they're why that brocade is mm -hmm. glittering. The chief copied the summer opera company's costume with the thin gold stripes. <laughs> and then when people asked him, well, why did, why did you do that? He said, because I didn't want to be upstaged by the women. Because Justice <laughs> O'Connor and I both wore I think I had a variety of colors that we, that we wore. Well, so, or are you the 
judge, or maybe you did it when you were a judge, I don't recall, or justice who started the, uh, what is now it seems to be a pattern among female jurists of wearing collars? Or I, I, I started uh, wearing collars on the DC circuit. Mm -hmm. And it was the result uh, of a gift from a woman who was then on the Supreme Court of Canada, Claire Louis Dubain. In, in Quebec, both the lawyers and the judges wear robes. Mm -hmm. And the, the men wore what is it's the traditional domier uh, mm -hmm. jabot, mm -hmm. the pleated. Mm -hmm. uh, the women at the bar in Quebec decided we can do a little better than that. Let's put a fancy lace collar <laughs> and add, add that to, to the jabot. So that, that gift started the, my color collection. And now I have many from uh, uh, just about around the globe. Wow. Somebody, t I read in one of the interviews that, and again, I don't know if this was accurate, that you have a dissent collar and a majority opinion <laughs> collar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the majority opinion collar uh, was a gift from my law clerks, and it's gold and <laughs> eye-catching, and the scent the collar is black <laughs> with, with gray beads. Well, um, seeing no, is there... One more audience question and two? Okay, and then we'll call it a halt. Thank you uh, for your time, Justice Ginsburg. I, I just had a question. As a young lawyer, um, what are some of the successful traits you've seen in advocates on your many years as a bench, and what advice would you give to young lawyers who are looking to be more successful advocates? But I, the advice I would give mainly to young lawyers about their careers is don't settle for being a plumber. That is, you have a skill, you can get a day's pay for a day's work. If you regard yourself as a true professional, you will do something outside yourself. You will do something that makes life in your community, in your country a little better. So I would say pick whatever is your passion, whether it's the environment, whether it's equality, and, and work together with like-minded people. Um, I've already given one piece of advice about oral, oral advocacy. That is, it's, it's not an occasion for speech making. It is a conversation between the lawyer and, and the judges. And if you can welcome, rather than present questions, uh, the court will, will appreciate your argument. Thank you very much. And could you please tell us who you are when you ask a question? Sure. I'm Josh Robin. I'm a reporter for New York One a television station here. Welcome back home to New York. Um, I've been reporting, a number of people around here have been reporting on corruption cases within the city and the state, and they have been overturned, a couple of them, um, because of the McDonald decision. Forgive me, I don't know if this breaks the, the Ginsburg rule, but I was wondering just generally if you can explain a little bit about the decision considering it's being cited so much, and people are concerned, certainly, about corruption within New York and across the country. Thank you so much, Your Honor. I, I didn't hear the opinion that you mentioned. Can you tell us the name of the... Oh, it's 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 McDon it is a the McDonald opinion, oh, um, oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Virginia, the ex-Virginia governor. Thank you. I can only say that every defendant, no matter how small or how large is entitled to due process. And that's, if you re read the McDonald 
opinion, you'll find that that is what motivated. Okay, well, Justice Ginsburg, thank you so much for everything you're going to do for the next 20 years at least. <laughs>